Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. and fungicides and pesticides are old. The veggies you are growing in your garden start to mold. If the ants are attacking and you're having a hard time, call Montana Egg Life. Nap weed in the ditch and the oval's got a itch. Fix upon my sheep and the wool is really cheap. The gophers in the pasture are even worse than last year. Montana Egg Life, where are you? Good evening. Welcome to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the very active campus of Montana State University. I'm Jack Rieselman. I'll be your host or moderator this evening. For those of you who have watched the show in the past, you know what to do. If you have questions that you would like answered concerning any of the expertise of the panel members we have tonight, call them in. The phone number will be on the screen shortly. And for those of you who have not watched it, you're welcome to phone in any questions that you would like. Tonight, we have a very special panel. We're going to have a good time. It's a diverse panel. We welcome all the questions that you can put in. So first, let me introduce the panel. Way on the end is Mary Burroughs. Mary is a plant pathologist, extension plant pathologist. Special guest tonight, Tracy Ross. Tracy is relatively new to Montana State University. We're going to come back to Tracy in a little bit and find out what she does. She's an equine specialist, and she'll get into all the stuff that she is responsible for and what she enjoys doing. Jane, you all know Jane Mangold. She's here several times during the course of the fall. Welcome, Jane. She's an invasive plant specialist. Uh, I like to call her a weed scientist, and that's the way I grew up, but it works. And everybody knows Toby. Toby is a specialist that has all the knowledge you need to know about relatively all horticultural crops. I was going to say something in your class. <laughs> okay, let me introduce the panel, or the phone operators over there. First of all, Nancy Blake. Then we have Cheryl Bennett. And Bruce Lobo. Bruce is a retired uh, water court judge here in Bozeman, and he helps fill in and answer the phones quite often. Let's move back to Tracy. Tracy, tell us what you do, and I'd like to welcome you to Montana, first of oh, all. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, so um, this is a newer position that they created within the department um, about a year ago. Um, it, they, the department itself has um, recognized the need um, for someone to kind of take over the facility out at the BART farm where the horses are housed um, due to um, class participation and then club interaction there at the BART farm and then to have somebody um, specifically um, manage the horse herd, um, the horses that are housed out at the BART. So, um, How many horses does MSU have out there? Um, MSU um, itself owns about 32 head of horses. Um, we lease an additional eight um, to kind of fill in for those classes that we may be short on horses for. Um, and then we also house um, instructor horses, so people that teach out there can keep two horses. And then I also am responsible for um, the rodeo stock, the horses that are used for rodeo practice out there. So there are actually courses here at MSU that teach for lack of being an animal scientist, I'm going to say horsemanship. Correct. Okay. Yes. A lot of students. Uh, yeah, we, we cap each class um, around 15 students. That's just for the safety reasons. It's a pretty small arena, um, but we do offer both semesters, um, beginner and uh, intermediate English and West, Western equitation classes, um, along with the colt starting um, class, and then they also do a spring course that's developing the young horse. Okay, is there actually, can you get a degree in equine science here at Montana State University? So it's an option within the animal science. Okay. So you actually, um, part of the animal science umbrella, there's three options and equine science is one of them. The other two is livestock management and then the science and industry option. All right, so, yeah. we'll come back to Tracy. We have a Perfect. couple of questions that have been emailed in and I'm sure there'll be some phone questions this evening. But meanwhile, 
Toby, and I have this problem too, and I'm kind of glad of it because I'm sick and tired of squash. <laughs> what is causing my squash to rot? Uh, there's a couple things that can cause squash to rot. Uh, one of them, especially on summer squash, is just blossom end rot, the same thing that we see on tomatoes. It's a calcium deficiency, but it's really inconsistent watering, so you want to make sure you have consistent water to your squash, and that will be on the blossom end of those squash. On winter squash, um, one of the things that I have seen is, is white mold. I think it's the similar one. I'm not a plant pathologist, but I think it's the same white mold that we have with beans yeah. and everything else. So if you get any kind of damage and it's touching the ground, then you can have, you can have damage to those winter squash also. So you don't want to move them around too much. You don't want to damage them any way that that mold can get into them, and it, and it can uh, take out a whole squash pretty quickly. I've seen it mostly in pumpkins, but you do see when, it. When do they harvest the winter squash? Uh, you harvest winter squash, it's difficult, right? Because everybody doesn't know when to harvest them. Uh, the only thing I can really tell you is the fingernail test. And I actually was going to bring a squash in today to show you this. But uh, if you can press your fingernail into the, the uh, rind of that, to the skin of it, pretty easily, it's not quite ready yet. Um, if it resists your fingernail, then it's probably ready. Okay. So that's a... I don't know. It's not the, really the best way to tell you that it's. If you got a lot of them, cut them open and find out. Yeah, if you, exactly. If you've got a ton of them, see if it's any good. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, Toby. Uh, Mary, as long as we're on rotten things, uh, this person <laughs> from Bozeman says, my garlic does not store well. What can they do? Um, and why? A lot of people plant their garlic in the same place year after year after year. They could move that. Um, there's a number of storage rots, so they could also get new seed stock, so and then not put it back in the area they've been storing their garlic. So clean everything, um, start fresh, and move the area. There's there's an I don't know what the different rots are. I know there's a fusarium dry rot, and there's a penicillium that moves in. I've seen a lot of penicillium through yeah. the years. Um, Especially if it's, you, know, you just don't cure it properly. Yeah, and you do have to like not leave it wet, like leave it out right. on the lawn in the sunshine for a while or With hang no it for rain. a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no rain. Yeah. And I, I, I often like leave too much soil on it, and I think you need to take that off. All right. Uh, we'll jump over to Jane, and this is a standard question that came in from Hamilton. Uh, does spotted knapweed still, or is spotted knapweed still producing seeds, or have they fallen off already? Yeah, we're probably right at that stage where the, the seeds want to fall off. I, I would just encourage the person to go out there, pick some of the, the dried up flower heads off and pull them apart. And if the seeds are on there, you will see them. They're, they're pretty obvious. They're little uh, brownish black, um, maybe an eighth of an inch long with a little white fuzzy thing on the top. They'll be packed into that little cup that was at the base of the flower. Um, I think we're probably right at the stage where they're going to be starting to fall off if they aren't already. So um, if, they're, if you don't find any of those little brown seeds with the white uh, fluffy part on the top, then yeah, they've fallen to the ground. There is nothing you can do to control spotted knapweed at this time of year. Is that correct? Or is there something you could do at this time of year? Well, if you had, uh, if the seeds are still on the plant, you okay. could go around and clip the tops off, bag those up, and burn them. So you, at least that this year's seed production wouldn't be going into the soil. But you can do fall uh, herbicide applications. Okay. Uh, fall is a good time to, to treat spotted knapweed. When the rosettes will start greening up again, right. the, the basil leaves. And uh, you can get pretty good control into next summer and even the summer beyond, depending on what you use when you spray in the fall. Okay. Thank you. So those seeds that drop now, they're going to overwinter before they germinate, correct? Yeah, most of them will. Yeah, I've, I'm thinking back to some of the reading I've done. Yeah, most of the seeds overwinter as seeds and then emerge next summer. Do a lot of people use a pre-emergent herbicide then in the spring? Is that common or is that's you know it's not very common in in range and pasture settings to use a pre-emergent. Okay. Sounds good. Tracy. Yes, sir. Question came in from Dylan. This person would like to purchase a horse for the first time. What do they look for in making a decision in purchasing a horse? Um, 
So the one thing that I would advise them on is, since they are first-time horse owners that they're right. looking to be, is, is to understand the fiscal responsibility with horse ownership and then also the time commitment. Um, so a lot of the, unfortunately, a lot of the welfare um, cases that you see are, is not out of malice. It's usually based on people not being educated on the nutritional requirements horses have or the space that they need. So as long as they have an understanding of um, what they're gonna use the horse for and they understand the facility requirements um, and the nutritional needs, um, routine dental work, farrier work, um, making sure they're up to date on their vaccinations, those type of things. Um, uh, the next step would um, be to determine what they're going to use the horse for. Um, is it going to be for recreational use? Is it going to be for competition? Are they wanting to get into cutting? Are they wanting to get into hunter jumper? Um, or are they, gonna, are they just looking for a horse for a 4-H project for their kids? So um, kind of identifying what they're going to use the horse for um, can kind of be a good indication of what they're looking for. Yeah, I, I've always been curious. and. I had a horse when I was a kid, but I don't remember much about that. How much does a horse, a full-grown horse, eat in a given day? So it depends on the horse, obviously, okay. the age, the breed, but typically a horse um, needs about one and a half percent of its body percentage body weight in dry matter. So if a horse is a hundred, the way that I look at it, if a horse is a thousand pounds, they need 15 pounds of, of forage grass. So they eat quite yep. a bit. They do, yes, yeah. and yes. Water, they consume a lot of water. Yeah, yeah. It depend. I mean, they need free access to fresh water um, and also salt as well. So, okay. yep. so I need to get you to talk to my daughter about budgeting for a horse. Yeah, she really, yeah. really wants a horse. Well, I, I'd like to ask Tracy because, uh, as a little girl, mm -hmm. of course. I wanted a horse and my right. dad was like, it's too expensive. Yeah. So what's a ballpark figure for the, like a the cost horse of or... owning a horse? For oh a gosh. Year? Wow. Um, Just, you know, not like super, not a high end horse, but a, um, a horse that a, a little girl might want <laughs> or a little boy. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of things to consider, you know, um, farrier work can, depending on um, keeping up with its, you know, six, usually six to eight weeks, you're having to either trim or put shoes on it. So that can run between 100 and 150 bucks every time you do it. Um, cost of hay, depending on um, if it's out on grass. So if you're looking at buying, you know, five or six ton of hay, that can run you easily six, seven hundred dollars. And then um, vet bills, vaccinations are key. Um, if it's going to be housed with other horses, um, have, if you're going to lease it or if you're going to keep it at a, if you're going to board it somewhere, there's usually monthly boarding costs associated with it, that type of stuff. So um, it can it can it can get pretty expensive. Then lessons, if you're wanting your daughter or your son to learn how to ride, those can also um, add up. So yeah. it sounds like it might be a little more expensive than my golden retriever. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, there's a follow-up question here too. And when making a decision to buy a horse, does it make a difference in purchasing a horse if it's for an adult or child, a younger person? Uh, it does. Um, obviously, it's their, that person's riding ability. Um, you're not going to want to purchase a three-year-old um, like colt to put your child on. So it all comes down to, again, what you're using the horse for and then that, that particular person's riding ability. Um, kid horses are great, like, like you know, older horse in their 20s. Um, if they've been trained well, those are good kid horses to start with. And then um, some adults, they want to use the horse more for competition. So you're going to get a younger horse for that particular reason that's probably been trained for that specific discipline. So okay. it all comes down to rider ability all right. and what their needs are. So I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to come back to Toby. <laughs> if Mary's daughter were to get a horse, what's it going to cost just for, I'll say, a companion horse or a very mellow 15 to 20 year old horse? Um, it depends on, um, so some people look at papered horses. Those are always going to be more, more right. you're going to pay more for those um, kind of black type pedigree horses, whereas you kind of hear the loose term of a grade horse. So grade horse is something you're going to see run through a sale. It's not going to be registered. It's not going to have any papers. It's probably going to be a mixed breed. Um, those are, those horses you may find for 500 bucks, 1500 bucks. Um, but for those higher end horses that you're gonna use for competitions, those can, those can get you know over 5,000 and probably up. I've been around horses that people have spent 
25000 up to, you know, $200,000, depending okay. on what they're using. We were, we were volunteering at the state horse <laughs> show this weekend, and those are some beautiful horses. Right. Yeah, Even I are. could appreciate them. Right, right. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, Toby from Laurel. This person has a vegetable garden area that's been fallow for three years. Nothing in it. Now she wants to make it an iris garden. How should she prepare it, and should she plant the iris now or in the spring? So, um, really not much else that you need to do. I mean, iris is a grass, it's a monocot, it grows fairly well, it's fairly easy to grow. Um, since it's been fouled for long enough, hopefully you don't have any weeds. The, I think the worst weed that you could get in uh, iris bed is Canada thistle. Um, so make sure you don't have any thistle around. And right now, or spring is not the best time, you actually want to transplant those about the th three weeks or so after they bloom. So it's going to be one of those midsummer plantings, uh, which is kind of rare for a lot of different plants, that's but true. that's when you're going to be planting those. But yeah, I would be very cautious about uh, Canada thistle. I have been <laughs> for the last five years trying to get Canada thistle out of iris at our iris bed out at the farm. And um, I don't know, I throw everything at it uh, and it doesn't seem to want to die. <laughs> so You know what happens, I think there's so many Canada thistle around Bozeman that it just repopulates every year. Well, I, no, I don't think so. This okay. just comes back. This is like, uh, you know, the vampire of, of uh, <laughs> thistle, you know, you just try to kill it and it just comes back or, you know, the nine lives of a cat. I don't know. Is there any like site requirements for iris that are better? Full sun for the most part. I mean, it is a grass, so it's gonna do better in full sun, but. All right, thank you. Uh, question from Townsend, Jane, and uh, Tracy, you can jump in too. What are common weeds that are poisonous or unhealthy for horses? Hmm. Um, well, thinking about, I tend to, the first weeds that pop into my mind are the ones that are on the state noxious weed list. And one of those is hound's tongue, which is uh, toxic to horses. Um, yellow star thistle, which thankfully we don't have in the state, but that can cause chewing disease. I don't know if you're familiar with that, Tracy. No. Um, Horiolissum is one that you would want to yeah. be cautious of. Uh, there's a lot of that around, and it seems to be increasing. Um, I'm probably forgetting some, Lupin. too. Lupin, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how sensitive horses are to that compared to cows. Um, but yeah, you know, there's both native and non-native, for, usually forbs, or broadleaved plants that uh, are toxic to different classes of livestock. Some mm -hmm. classes more sensitive mm -hmm. to certain species than others. It's probably not extremely common to have horse poisoning because I think you know, a lot of them are pastured, but not in, you know, yeah, I riparian think areas and stuff. What what typically happens is if if you have some forage that's contaminated with okay. a poisonous plant. A couple years ago, uh, well, it was last year in the with the droughty conditions, we had a lot of issues with poison hemlock in forage, and uh, we guessed that it may have been because people were really harvesting as far out in the perimeter of their fields as possible to try to get as much forage as possible and you get those weedy things growing on the edge of a field. Um, so that's definitely something you want to watch out for. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know, last week I mentioned that a uh, person that used to sit in this chair and was kind of the face of this program for a long time, Hayden Ferguson celebrated his 90th birthday. At the end of today's program, I want to give you his address, have a pen ready, and if you've have been a longtime viewer of Ag Live. You just might drop Hayden a belated birthday card. I'm sure he'd enjoy it. He's, I know, enjoyed his 90th birthday. I've been told he had a great time. So I'll give you that address a little bit later on. Uh, Tracy, this person is interested in hearing more about uh, purchasing a horse, and they want to know if they were to purchase quote, he says, a used horse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think they all are. <laughs> <laughs> they would like to know how important would it be to have an exam, a veterinarian <laughs> exam, before buying a horse. So like a pre-purchase exam? Yeah, pre-purchase exam. Um, I, I would always recommend to get one. Um, it's, it's, it's imperative. Um, I know when, when I look at horses, um, especially after I've gone through kind of the checklist, I've decided that this is something that would be 
um, good for our program is to get a vet check. Um, and there's, vet checks can be, there's an extensive form, depending on the type of horse that you're purchasing, they can go all the way from like um, extensive blood work, all the way doing radiographs, it's kind of doing a diagnostic on the horse to determine it, but um, a pretty basic one can determine, um, so a vet can come in and do what's called an examination at rest. They start with basically um, the head to the tail, They'll, they'll look at the horse's teeth. Um, they'll determine the age. That's the per first indicator is if, if the, the buyer's telling you, oh, the horse is 12, and the vet's like, well, he's actually 20. <laughs> and so you can kind of eliminate it based on that. Um, they'll check its eyes okay. to make sure that there isn't any or abnormalities. They'll do, um, they'll kind of do a look over, do temperature, respiration, um, pulse, those type of things. Um, basically and then they'll do a lameness exam and that and the one thing people need to understand is a pre-vet or pre-purchase exam is not an indication of future soundness in the horse so it's just basically them giving you um, an assessment of the horse in its current condition and you you are going to decide if you're going to continue with the purchase or not so, right. so they have yeah. carfax.com now they need <laughs> horsefax.com <laughs> exactly for your entrepreneurs out there get on that i have kind of a crazy question mm -hmm. are there treadmills for horses <laughs> i was thinking are. about stress tests and i was yeah they're yeah, usually so there... done underwater <laughs> Yes. Okay. Obviously, a horse yeah. is going to walk yeah. on a treadmill. Yeah. They, it's for okay. therapy or rehabilitation okay. if they've had an injury. Yeah. Usually, even race horses, mm -hmm. they'll do it. They'll be on a treadmill. Hmm. Um, they'll do like the um, the swimming pool. They'll have them okay. just kind of rehab them that it's way. It's like pool so, jogging yeah. for us. Yeah. 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 Right. Do they have stationary right. bikes for them? Because I'd pay to see that. That would be awesome. Mary, are you still considering a horse down the line? Right. Uh, hmm. <laughs> Uh, a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. um, for my own edification, are there uh, enough equine vets in a state mm -hmm. like Montana that it's pretty easy to get a um, pre-purchase exam? Yeah, there's there's quite a fit. Um, I work with, I don't specifically work with one vet. I work with um, probably three or four different types of clinics here in Gallatin County. Um, so there, there are quite a few that there, there are a lot of options okay. um, that people have to. So it's not a problem finding somebody no. to do that. No, and they're all pretty versed. Most veterinarians, that's a pretty typical, especially equine. Th those veterinarians that are specific for large animals, especially yeah. equine, they, that's something that they do on a regular basis. So, all right. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mary from Fairfield. And for those of you who don't know, Fairfield's up just on the kind of west end of the Golden Triangle. Uh, this brewer has a black city mode on their barley and they're wondering if that will harm the grain or if they can feed it to cows or any other livestock. Okay so I'd need to see a picture to tell you what it was. The common possibilities are sooty mold which is a black growth on the outside of the head which is very common at harvest especially if you've gotten some moisture. There's also smuts and bunts which will replace the grain with a loose material which we can easily diagnose and then there's ergot which would be toxic to livestock. So that's more of a hard piece and they're more than welcome to send a sample to their county agent or directly to the diagnostic lab. But the, the sooty mold and the smuts and bunts are fine. Yeah, the ergot kind of looks like a mouse has been on the top of the head. Yep, and okay. it basically looks like a grain of barley that's black. Black, right. Uh, from Hamilton, uh, Jane, this caller has leafy spurge, tansy something or other, and goldenrod issues. They would like to know the most effective treatment, I assume that's tansy mustard, uh, to spray for those weeds. Mm. Yeah, that's a suite of weeds that are all quite different in their growth habit. Uh, there is not going to be a one size fits all treatment for those. Uh, if it's tansy mustard, it's an annual, so you'd be focusing on controlling those seedlings next spring. Leafy spurge is <laughs> just a perennial problem. If, if it's been on your property for more than three or five years, you're probably stuck with it and you're focused more on just trying to contain it and keep it from spreading. And then what was the, the third one? Yeah, was tansy mustard and goldenrod. Goldenrod. Well, goldenrod, is that's actually a native okay. for, but can be kind of weedy. It will in, uh, spread or it has year, some years where it does really well and other years where it's not quite so problematic. I would encourage the, the person to think about pre 
not getting rid of the goldenrod, particularly since they have other weedy broadleaf plants. Uh, by taking out that goldenrod, you may just be opening up space Spurs. for the leafy, leafy spurge to expand. So I, I can't really give a an easy answer for all three of those, but if the person wants to give me a call, we can visit about, about it on the phone. For my edification, I, we know that a lot of people have used sheep through the years mm -hmm. and trained them to eat leafy spurge. Mm -hmm. Will cattle eat, or horses, or anything else eat the leafy spurge, or could be trained to eat leafy spurge? You know, I haven't seen that work done on leafy spurge. Uh, it has that white, milky sap yeah, in it, yeah. which can, is an irritant to, I mean, it's toxic to some classes of livestock. Sheep and goats can deal with that, but I'm not sure horses could. But I've, I've never, they're pretty selective in what yeah. they eat. I don't, I've, I've never, never seen, seen anything that they would. You know, we know cattle will eat <clears throat> spotted knapweed, sulfur sink foil, Canada thistle, but I've not seen nor heard of anybody using cattle or cattle to graze leafy spurge. You know, a good indication is if it, deer will eat anything in a rough winter, but they don't really eat leafy spurge. Mm -hmm. They'd really eat, eat tree bark or something. Okay. So that's probably the answer yeah. there. Uh, this person hadn't watered his lawn this summer. Should he still fertilize it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that helps. <laughs> so if you're the type of person that just doesn't want to water uh, for whatever reason might be a water savings or uh, you just uh, just don't want to, didn't have time, um, still this fall I would I'd put some fertilizer down because the grass is greening up as it gets cooler, we're getting some moisture, it will take up that fertilizer and then it'll be ready to go first thing in the spring. So if you are a, a minimalist when it comes to taking care of your lawn, Fall fertilizer is the best, and I would still get out and try to fertilize that. Probably first part of October, first week in October would be best time okay. to fertilize. Um, it should start greening up here, and nights are yeah, definitely cooler. Um, and the other thing you can do this time of year, Jane, is this a good time of year to get rid of your dandelions and a lot of other broad leaves in your lawn? Yeah, yeah. Probably the best so. time of the year. Yeah. Okay. yeah, very much so. And. There's a lot of herbicides. We're not going to recommend any particular one. No, oh, yeah, we are. I do. Two four D. Yeah. Two four D definitely to get rid of dandelions and thistle. It works well in your in your yard. If you have any, uh, this is kind of my general recommendation. Two four D works really well for those. Mm -hmm. If you have other harder to kill weeds, things that are out there, uh, clover, some of these you know little kinopodiaceae is what they call mm -hmm. them. These horrible little weeds that get in your lawn sometimes. Triclopur, um, and there are a couple products out there. Uh, I think that works a whole lot better on these just really kind of difficult weeds to get rid yeah, of. Yeah, so Toby's mentioning active ingredients yes. and, and just encourage viewers to focus on the active ingredient mm -hmm. that is within the product that they're buying. So there'll be a product name, but then look down below that name for the active ingredient and you want to see, like he mentioned 2,4-D or triclopyr. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Sounds great, thank you. Tracy, <clears throat> a question from Belt. Uh, this is kind of in your area. A vet has told this person that if a horse is vaccinated three years in a row for West Nile virus, which can be devastating to horses, it is good for the life of the horse. Do you think that's true? We um, always vaccinate for West Nile um, every year. Every that's part of our seven way that we do in the spring. Um, I've never really heard of people, unless it's a closed herd, um, some people will only do what's called the core vaccine, which is your rabies and your tetanus. Those are more the zoonotic um, properties that you right. would, if a horse got it, could spread it to another horse and they're more fatal. Um, but I, we, we typically booster, or I'm sorry, we vaccinate for West Nile every year. I think to be yeah. safe. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is for both Mary and Toby. This person is in Stevensville. They have dahlias that has powdery mildew this summer. Will the tubers be all right to store and replant? Don't. <laughs> I mean, somebody can say. I don't, think it, I don't think it goes to the tuber. Yeah, it's yeah, not going to cause any yeah. on the yeah. tuber. It should be fine. And, and just 
you know, don't water them overhead next year maybe as much. Or. Yeah, some drip irrigation. And, and really when they come up um, early on, you can use some fungicides. I mean, yeah. it's not necessarily recommended. You're not going to eat it, so it's yeah. probably fine. Air movement, a little bit of sunlight to them. Um, don't overhead water and you shouldn't have as much powdery mildew. Okay. Second part of the question, again from Stevensville. I can't grow dahlia, so I'm just kind of <laughs> okay. jealous. Uh, this person also has clover type unknown in their Kentucky bluegrass. We just covered this a little bit. Is there something they should do this fall to specifically control the clover? Triclopyr. <laughs> you want to spell that? T-R-I-C-L-O-P-Y-R. It's kind of hard to find uh, for a homeowner use. Uh, I found it in a couple of places. Uh, again, because I'm extension, I can't recommend one company or one product over another, but uh, go to your garden centers, your hardware stores, ask around, see if they have the active ingredient, um, because it does work. Uh, I have found that it works pretty well for getting some, rid of some of those harder to kill stuff. I have some weird asters and things like that in my yard, and it gets rid of them. Does Banville help? Will Banville get the clover? Oh, I'm sure it will, but I don't think it's registered for your lawn. Well, Di it's, dicamba. Dicamba, yeah. It's yeah, dicamba. Some, yeah. Well, that, uh, I use the trade name instead of the... Yeah, well, I don't think Banville is something that you should be used in your Around lawn. <laughs> well, that would be a federal It's in a lot of yeah. lawn it's and garden products. Yeah, yeah, dicamba, yeah. yeah, dicamba works uh, very similar to 2,4-D. Okay. One, one comment, the triclopyr, it does, it has some soil residual, mm -hmm. so don't if you if it's clover in the lawn it's fine there and residuals good because it's going to keep controlling that clover but don't get it other places where you might want to plant a broad-leaved and don't plant save your lawn year. clippings and compost them right and put them on your garden right so it, it does uh, have some persistence so mm -hmm. read the label yes yep. i've heard mm -hmm. that someplace yes <laughs> <No. laughs> uh tracy this person from roundup and that's up in the central part of the state. Mm -hmm. They found what they considered the perfect horse. Uh, a mule. No such <laughs> <laughs> uh, they would like, and they also have several other horses. Is there a best way to introduce a perfect horse they found into their current herd? Uh, so what I do um, is I typically, um, once I purchase a horse, I go through, and it's and it arrives on the farm. I have obviously biosecurity measures that the horse has to have: um, negative Coggins, it's current on its vaccines. I segregate that horse for about seven to ten days, um, just in case if he does come up with any kind of contagious um, symptoms, it's going to hopefully fall come in on the that during that time frame. Um, and then I slowly introduce them to the herd, either through. Um, next to another pen that way they can kind of have over the fence introductions um, and then if it's in a bigger herd establishment um, I try to find two or three horses that may be lower on the pecking order that okay. I introduce him to at first so he kind of has a buddy because um, when you kind of turn him out with those bigger horses they can actually kind of beat up on him so it's kind of nice to have two or three horses that he's already been acclimated to That's it. it's yeah. kind of like an alpha Male it is, dog. right, the, uh, right. The horses act the same, right? They do, sure. yeah. They're definitely, um, they have those behavioral instincts of where they kind of um, keep their own little clicks together. It's interesting. Um, and when you do bring them in together, you want to observe it. It's it's preferably to do it during the day. You don't want to turn them out at night where horses really don't, um, can't really see and you can't see what's going on. Um, I have a dry lot that I use. It has continuous fence, so good fencing, so good footing. So, because the first thing they're going to do is run each other around. So you don't want to put them in a pasture that has grass up to their waist and there's badger holes. So, it's always nice to kind of introduce them in more of like a a, a better enough room for them to move around. But then they can kind of acclimate and then you can okay. kind of turn them. Good up words together. of advice. Yeah. Um, Mary, this person uh, is from Helena, and they grew some chickpeas in the area um, they would like to know was there a lot of iascochyta uh, statewide which is a fungus disease in chickpeas mm -hmm. this year well we grew a lot of susceptible varieties because um, those are the ones that are contracted I would say that despite the spring moisture we really didn't have a whole lot of ascochyta people have been very vigilant about scouting and spraying a fungicide where needed so I think Despite the spring coolness, we really didn't see much disease. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, from Haver, this person uh, wants to know if it's too late to spray Roundup on an area that they want to turn into a garden next year. No, is that, I, don't I don't know. Is that, so. is that for you or me? Yeah, I think it's still, <laughs> still good. Oh yeah, I don't think I'd we've had any first. part. Yeah, make sure it's. Yeah, stuff is green and well watered, so it's actively growing. Um, I think it's actually a great idea because yeah. you're going to be getting rid of a lot of those kind of winter annuals and then mm -hmm. you're probably going to yeah. have to spray again in the spring before you put that garden in just to get rid of some of those well also winter annuals but you know summer annuals and winter annuals that way you're kind of getting rid of uh, all Everything. of those things that are in there so it'd be a good time to spray this fall and then hit it again in the spring you want to probably do it just before it freezes if you could and make sure it's very green that's that's true, but I also I also kind of subscribe, and I don't know if you do too, but I kind of like waiting till after that first hard freeze. Okay. Because it really those plants are now pushing all oh, the good. sugars down the root system, and that's like a really good time to hammer them. Okay. You know? I'll kick, buy that. You know, it's, it's, you kick them when they're down, <laughs> right? <laughs> you got it, uh, Mary. You have some fine-looking yep. carrots in I do. front of you. They're from uh, my own garden. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mary's going to explain what's going on. And if you grow carrots, you'll probably see this on and off in your garden. So go ahead, Mary. Yeah, so this is a disease called aster yellows of carrot. And it's a lovely disease. Um, <laughs> they have purple leaves and yellow leaves. And then you'll see the roots are very, very bushy. And then when you taste the carrot, it's bitter. Yeah. And this is a leafhopper transmitted disease. Um, it doesn't overwinter except maybe in some perennials. You'll not only see, pick, see symptoms on your carrots, you'll probably also see it on the flowers next door, especially the asters. Mm -hmm. um, you'll get witch's broom, so um, tightly bunched leaves, and then the flowers get replaced with leaves. So the reproductive parts are vegetative parts. And this is due to a hormone imbalance that the pathogen causes in the the plant. So it's one of my favorites. I did I did part of my PhD on this. What percentage of your carrots actually had? Like two feet maybe. I think okay. it traveled down the row but that was about it. I'll feed these to the bunnies. Do Mary, you have rabbits that you let eat in your garden? No, we deliver them oh, to well. my pampered children. <laughs> forage rabbits, of course. Do they turn their noses to it because it's bitter? They're really cute when they eat. I'll, show, I'll have you over. You can see them. They're funny. Mary, is it safe to eat those if yeah. a human wanted to eat Yeah, they just don't taste them? good. Okay. And so if you ever get a bag of carrots mm -hmm. at the store and they're really bitter, they probably had some mm. astral. So it's a virus, is that no, right? No, it's a phytoplasma. It's so a it's phytoplasma. a cell wall okay. of bacteria. Okay. So would rotation, uh, is that doesn't permanent? matter. Is it, it just, permanently in the soil? Or? No, it just comes in occasionally. Really? I, I see it every few years. You've seen it in your garden too, right? Oh, yeah, I've yeah. had it. Yeah, generally one or two carrots out of a roll and that's it. Yeah, yeah. just curiosity. Uh, I've okay. never had it. So They're I'm harder curious. to peel. We can yeah. fix that. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see my massively sized carrots yeah, in my wonderful yeah. garden. Yeah. <laughs> okay, enough on carrots. Um, <laughs> the caller called in, and it's some advice from a 90-year-old retired farmer. And he wants to talk about Canadian thistle or Canada thistle. He says it can be ki killed easily if sprayed before they bud with curtail. Mm-hmm. Curtail is great in pastures, right? Yeah, yeah. But it can no longer be used in lawns. I believe you are right. It's clopyrrolid is the active ingredient. Right. And I think it was maybe marketed as something else Can for lawn wrong? and garden. But yeah, yeah. It, was, it, it also has a residual. It does. So, um, you know, that may have been one of the reasons why it, it was. it's no longer used in lawn and garden. If I'm correct, so yeah, Confront I think was one of the trade names that was out there and I think one of the reasons why it was taken off is because of grass clippings mm, being put mm -hmm. into municipal composting facilities and, and having issues that way. Yeah. Uh, it is still used actually in, in turf grass situations but it, uh, it is not uh, something that a homeowner can go out and get. It, so. it is a wonderful product on Canada Thistle in pastures or in areas where it's allowed to spray. You know, about a month after you spray, you will not see any Canada thistle, and mm -hmm. it kills it way down the root system. Um, okay, from Monarch, Toby, is it better to plant apple trees in the fall or in the spring? 
Oh, that's a 50 50. <laughs> you know, well, that's a good the answer. Spring or plant them in the fall. That's when I recommend to plant them. So When you have time. Um, yeah, it's exactly when you can get them in the ground. But uh, so the, a couple of quick things is a lot of times you get apple trees that are bare root. You're going to only find those in the spring. Uh, if they're in a pot, you can plant them any time of the year. It's still better to plant them in the spring or in the fall. Um, and in fact, uh, I would kind of wait until I, uh, you know all the leaves are kind of turning color and falling off the trees late in the season is going to be a best time because it's going to be completely dormant. Right. So nothing's going to really affect it, affect it and it's going to be ready to go first thing in the spring. So yeah, it's a great time. Okay. Um, is a good time to pick apples. I see apples all over Bozeman on the ground. I know the yeah. bears are enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and that's something I was gonna bring in next week and I forgot this week, but uh, if you cut into an apple and you look at the seeds, if the seeds are dark brown or black, then it's, it, it's ripe. Um, and a lot of times people still leave them on the tree as long as they'll stay on the tree for more sugar. But if you cut them open and they're light tan or there's white spots on the, on the seeds, or the seeds themselves are white, then they are not ready to pick yet. Um, they're still so, you know, I see a lot of people picking really green apples right now and, and uh, yeah, just wait a while. I like them green, I like them tart. You do, huh? Yeah. So well, how do the bears check them if they're ready or not? Believe it or not, because uh, uh, I had a bear in the Hort Farm last year, and it knew exactly which ones were ripe and which that's ones weren't. They'll go around, they'll they'll take a bite of one, and they're like, no, that's not what I smell. I smell <laughs> a really good one in here. And when they find that tree, they'll tear it apart. But, and they're they're probably know. looking for as much sugar as they can get. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, for those of you who have pears, if you take a pear in the palm of your hand and you just lift it up, and if you lift that pear and it, and it comes off at the stem fairly easily, mm -hmm. that means that it's ripe. Now, we don't pick pears when they're ripe. If you lift it up and it doesn't come off, then it's not ready to pick yet. But then what you wanna do is put it in a cold storage, bring it out, and it usually takes one or two weeks. It ripens from the inside out. Yeah. So that's why uh, when you go to the grocery store, sometimes you get really hard pears and you wait for a little bit and then they're it's good. like super soft because it's ripening from the inside out. All right. Good information, uh, Toby, thanks. Uh, Tracy, question from Livingston. This person has been told by several people that grass hay is better for horses than alfalfa hay, and other people say the alfalfa hay is prettier and the horses like it more. So what's the story on the best way to feed a horse? Well, okay. alfalfa is definitely more palatable to for horses, so okay. it's especially like those are your legumes, and so forage is forage. You have your grasses and your legumes. Um, the difference is the protein content. So, like Timothy grass has about nine percent protein versus alfalfa that has eighteen percent. Um, alfalfa is a great winter feed for horses because obviously they need more protein um, because of the cold weather metabolic rates increase so horses need more calories so that's a great winter feed. Um, I typically don't feed it in the summer unless it's a horse that is a performance horse and you're, you're supplementing it with, um, you're mixing it with a grass flake and an alfalfa flake. Um, they're, Gr hay is, is great, any source of hay is, is good for horses, um, but I typically um, feed more alfalfa in the winter. You know, in the Midwest, mm -hmm. um, I used to know a few people in the Panhandle of Nebraska that grew a lot of Timothy hay mm -hmm. that they shipped down to Kentucky for the, the race horses. Okay. Is there a reason that they were using Timothy hay instead of alfalfa for race horses or not? I couldn't really answer that. Um, I'm not really sure. I do know that their um, their fescue toxicity can can oh, happen oh, yeah, in horses, yeah, especially right. with pregnant mares. And I know I think I want to say around 2003 to 2014, they had a lot of issues yeah. with um, mares aborting their foals because of it. And that could have been due to um, black walnut seed. There was a, a tree yeah. there that actually dropped a lot of its um, walnuts, and the horses That's were right. consuming it then. But yeah, you can actually get some toxicity. In We've that. actually years ago had some fescue toxicity right. down in the south south central part of the state, mm -hmm. uh, Joliet area and so forth. We had quite a bit of it mm -hmm. and finally figured out what it was. And, um, it is devastating right. to a horse herd. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question this person has, they would like to, they have several horses, they would like to know what's a healthy treat for their horses. And she says, there's really like zucchini. <laughs> and you'll like this, an eggplant. <laughs> <laughs> 
There's Is something wrong with that horse. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that, you know, for a healthy treat? You know, I've always heard carrots and apples, but. Uh, yeah, that's true. I usually stick with that. Um, I'm not a big advocate of giving treats to horses because of the fact that, especially when we have a lot of students, we bring horses in, we obviously give them grain. It's kind of a reward system they're eating out of um, their their pan. Um, I'm not a huge advocate of giving horses treats by the mouth because then they get in the habit of biting at mm, your hand sense. the second that you put a halter on so they're expecting a treat. But I think apples and carrots are, are perfectly fine. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jane from Gallatin Gateway, they have a lot of horealism on their property and would like to treat it with a herbicide yet this fall. There are seed piles on the plants. If I spray my plants, will it kill the seeds? Yeah, it's too late for yeah. that to happen. We have done some research where we sprayed horealism at a certain growth stage and it did stop viable seed production, but that was in mid-June. So yeah, I think uh, the person's missed the chance, but there's going to be a lot of rosettes down there, yeah. and um, if you use a product that has like met sulfuron in it, that will stay in the soil, and um, those seeds that were produced this year will uh, be, when they germinate, they'll be exposed to that herbicide. Okay, thank you. Uh, question, bitter cucumbers, how come? Mm. <laughs> Did they plant a pickling variety instead yeah. of a slicing? You know, I've actually, in some years, um, had bitter cucumbers, and I think it's a watering regime. Yeah, I think it's yeah. the lack of water and really hot. And hot. Uh, yeah, I was when wondering it gets if hot heat. And it's, there's a lack of water, they'll get some bitterness to them. Uh, but it also has to do with cultivar uh, that you get. Some of them are more bitter than they others. They should be happy they got cucumbers. I didn't get any. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, it was amazing. I went to the Western Agricultural Research Center a year or two ago, and they had a trial on different slicing cucumbers, and I thought a cucumber tasted like a cucumber. And they had about seven or nine of different kinds out there, and it was amazing, the different in, difference in tastes. And so um, I would try different cultivars, because what's bitter to you might be what everybody likes, but I think our, our palates are a little bit different. And so uh, I was totally amazed, because, you know, so cucumber, it's not all right? just Market War 76? No, I no. can't even remember what the one was that I liked. The Field King or something like that was really good. But Sounds fun. Yeah. It, I have found that it, if a cucumber is at all under stress and they're a bit shriveled and a bit smaller, the likelihood of them being bitter mm -hmm. is greater than a nice, healthy, full-grown cucumber. Um, from Haver, this caller asks whether Pythium can be eliminated by crop rotation. Um, they have an organic um, operation and they would like to see whether or not they could rid the pythium using that. So the pythium, the oospores have a very thick wall on them. They last at least five years for pythium. They're not quite, quite as long lived as the phenomyces. I would say some crops are much more susceptible to pythium, especially those large seeded crops. And if you wait for the soil to warm, then it's not as likely that the pythium will infect the, the plant. So if you wait till the soil temperature is at least, what, 55, something like that. Um, so planting late can help with pythium issues. And they would like to grow organic chickpeas, which is really difficult oh, because of that. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I had the opportunity to speak to Senator Tester when I was in D.C., and the first thing he asked me about was chickpeas, why they didn't emerge. I said, they're organic chickpeas. It was pythium. No. I didn't even have to go much farther. No. They, it, the pythium, the chickpeas smell pythium and they just die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> they do. Uh, the kabulis. The desis actually aren't quite as bad. No, desis. The desis not. with the dark seed coat, they're they're much more tolerant. They're, it's a sugary exudate during the germination process mm -hmm. that is kind of like bears and apples. We, we wrote a page, Rachel Lysa, who just started at Western Ag. Yeah. Her master's thesis was all about organic growing organic chickpeas. So. You need to stop speaking yes. German. We have a pathologist on either end of the table here. So. Okay, <laughs> we're out of it. We're moving on to something else. Uh, Tracy from Montana City. Um, if you have information on this, uh, please share it. This person would like you to comment on recent equine infectious anemia case at the Denver horse sale, which infected horses from several 
states. Have you heard about that? I am not familiar with that, okay. not at all. Tell you what, we'll save that okay. and find out about that. Uh, Missoula. Uh, Toby, their onion sets didn't grow, but the rest of the garden was fine. Why? Uh, that could be a million reasons why. Um, you got bad onion sets, because <laughs> onion sets are pretty easy to grow, so I'm not sure. Would there be any disease within those onion sets that would cause that? They could have some bulb rot. Yeah. There, there's a Tospo virus that infects onions. Yeah, it just that mm. seems like you probably just got some bad onion sets. Yeah. They were probably dehydrated when they put them in and just didn't come back. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. It doesn't, it's, should, I mean, it's not something I've ever. Try again yeah. next yeah. year, right? Yeah, I'll try again Buy next somewhere year. somewhere else and try again, yeah. Onions are pretty inexpensive yeah. in the store. Mm -hmm. uh, from Billings, uh, Jane, is it better to use curtail or milestone with escort on thistles and any type of thistle? So they want to know if they should combine curtail or milestone with escort. Well, first off, esco Escort, which is met sulfuron, doesn't do anything to thistle, thistle. So, and it's expensive, so I wouldn't put it out there. Uh, clopyrrolid or aminopyrrolid, they're very similar chemistries. Um, the aminopyrrolid, which is milestone, may give a little longer control, residual control. I think the, like the half-life on clopyrrolid is a little shorter. Shorter. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Bozeman, uh, this person... In past years, notice their horses are a little thin as they go into the winter time. Uh, what do they need to do to prepare a horse for one of Montana's cold winters if they spend a lot of time outside? Uh, so what I do with our horse herd, we um, we weigh them and body condition score them about four times a year. And so most recently, we weighed all our horses coming off summer pasture. So that kind of gives us an idea of where they're at on a body condition score. Um, because it's really hard to put weight on a horse in the middle of winter. And so ideally you want your horses to be moderately to, uh, moderately good to good condition. Um, and it's an easy assessment that you can do um, where fat deposits all are around, their withers, um, their spine, if they have a full rump. Um, if you're able to not see their rib cage, but you can actually feel it, that means they got some good fat cover on there. Um, and then they have a firm but not crested neck. Um, that tells you that the horses are in pretty good shape going into winter. Um, ideally, if they're not, if they're probably um, in uh, poor condition, you want to kind of increase their um, con their body condition. Um, you want to do it preferably 90 to 120 days out to what, give you time. You mentioned uh, body score. Mm -hmm. uh, explain what that might be. I, I'm not familiar with. Okay, it. so it's a um, it's basically an evaluation of it's a visual and a um, you kind of basically run your hands over. There's six yeah. points on a horse that okay. they um, they collect fat, um, and it's a scale between one and nine. Um, anything between one and four um, is where horses um, don't have a lot of fat on their body. Um, and it's a visual assessment as well. A lot of welfare, um, like law enforcement, will use this scale to determine what condition the horse is in. Um, and so uh, you can check for points along, um, again, the neck, um, the withers, along the top line, which is the spine, um, the top of the tail head, the ribs behind the shoulder. And you basically give each of those points a scale between one and nine to, based on how fleshy they are. And then you take the average of that, so you actually end up getting one score. And so ideally, you want your horses between a five and a six. Okay. Anything over that number, seven to nine, the horses are considered obese, and so that's when you want to try to take weight off of them. Anything under a four, you, that's where you want to start looking at um, putting weight on. But there could be other um, factors. It, there could be the horses could have internal parasites. They could be... Um, malnourished, not okay. getting enough feed, that kind of stuff. So. so let me throw this question at you. Mm -hmm. If Toby were to go out and score a horse, <laughs> <laughs> how would he know what to do? So what he would do is um, you, you want to be um, looking at the horse. You're going to, everything's based on feel. Um, and the biggest thing is you want to discern between muscle and fat. Okay. Um, so you're going to be, and you're actually going to be able to see it. And so um, winter time is not the ideal time to look at it because you'll, horses are going to have their winter coat. And so a lot of it's based on palpation and feeling. All right, thank you. We're mm -hmm. getting down kind of toward the end, but there's one question from Helena. 
that I'm going to throw back to you. Can a caller feed broccoli to his horses oh as a goodness. treat? <laughs> Watch your fingers if you do, right? Yeah, I don't. I don't. This might be a question more for you guys. Uh -uh. I don't see. Not I don't see a problem. <laughs> <laughs> if they Sounds like good it, to me. Okay. if they like yeah. it, if they like it, dogs like peas. So I, I mean, oh yeah, dogs beer, love so. peas and, and carrots. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. A couple things. Uh, we're coming down toward the end of the uh, program. I want to throw this up on the screen. Um, please, if you get a chance, send Hayden Ferguson a uh, happy 90th birthday. Uh, he would appreciate it. He's just really kind of misses this program. And I think you would enjoy hearing from you. And a lot of you who have watched it for the last 25 years probably remember Hayden. Next week, uh, we're gonna have Wendy Stock here. Wendy Stock is an economist who kind of specializes in labor issues. And we do know that we have serious labor issues in the state. Uh, she will be here to discuss that. With that, I wanna thank the panel, the phone operators, Tracy, it was a pleasure having you here. We'll have you back again sometime. Horses are a big part of Montana. Yes. Folks, thanks for walking. See you next week. Good night. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Get your own Montana Ag Live mug or hat when you pledge your support. Watch your favorite Montana Ag Live show online or join our Facebook discussion when you visit the Montana Ag Live link at montanapbs.org.